For centuries, the sea was the final frontier. The barrier that had to be breached before the whole map of the world could be drawn. The last major region to be charted was the South Pacific. And that challenge brought James Cook, captain of the Endeavour, here to New Zealand's east coast in October of 1769. Cook went on to circumnavigate this country. And as something of a sailor myself, this is what I've dreamed of doing since I was a boy. I'm following Cook's voyage of discovery on all kinds of ships and boats, starting here on the magnificent spirit of New Zealand. The first land the Endeavour's crew saw was young Nick's head. Right over there. Captain's Log, Monday 9th October 1769. Stood into the bay and anchored on the northeast side before the entrance of a small river. There's one thing about all the sailors I've ever met. They all know about James Cook. When he sailed in here at the helm of the Endeavour, he was 40 years old. But he started at sea at 17, a working class kid out of Whitby. He started working the colliers in the North Sea. He went on to the Royal Navy where he had a glittering career as a surveyor, astronomer and navigator. And now here he was at the helm of probably the most important scientific expedition of its day. Part of Cook's mission was to explore uncharted reaches of the South Pacific for the fabled Great Southern Continent. Cook knew the land he'd reached could be part of this coastline charted by Dutch explorer Abel Tasman in 1642. If so, Cook's orders were to chart it fully, make friends with the inhabitants, and claim the country for his king. After nearly three months at sea from Tahiti, Cook badly needed fresh water, firewood, and food. Da. Cook and his crew landed as far as we can tell, right over there, behind those timber yards. This was near the mouth of the Turanganui River. Cook could see people on the other side and he wanted to talk with them. Nowadays, it's hard to talk with anybody around here. This area here where I'm walking now, was once a narrow channel where Cook and his crew brought his boats into land. This was once a beach. And this flagpole marks the spot where Cook first set foot on New Zealand soil, or sand. Nice, isn't it? There's a monument here too, erected in 1906, and a bit of a native tree and shrub garden surrounding the place, but really, one of New Zealand's most historic sites has pretty much been swallowed up by the Gisborne Port development. Officially, this area beneath Kaiti Hill is a National Historic Reserve, but clearly history hasn't been allowed to stand in the way of progress. The monument remains, but the view across the bay to Young Nick's Head is gone, and reclamation has buried the narrow channel that Cook used. The same channel where centuries earlier, two of the great waka landed carrying Maori from Polynesia. James Cook, I presume. Nice view you've got, Jim. In nice Italian clothes. Apparently, he's wearing an Italian naval uniform. Actually, this James Cook is a replica of a statue that used to stand outside a brewery in Auckland. James and crew did not have a good time when they were here. Down there in the bay, where that slipway is, two Maori died in two days and three more were mortally wounded. And then out here in the bay, when he tried to kidnap three boys from a canoe, possibly up to four more were killed. When Cook arrived, this area known as Turanganui Akiwa was home to four main iwi. 
It was the Tupuna, the ancestors of the Ngati Onioni people, who made the first contact. I think they probably were absolutely astounded. They probably were trying to fathom exactly what had arrived, something completely off the planet for them. Perhaps an island had risen out of the water and um, had formed in the bay. And what they did was what they would do for any visitor. They would go down and do a thing called a matataki, which generally people refer to as a wet or a challenge. And four of my tipuna went down onto the beach that day to offer a challenge to establish the intent of the visitors. And unfortunately that day, um, and amongst the confusion and the misunderstandings of things, um, Tamara was shot. The next day, Tahitian high priest Tupaya, who'd sailed with Cook from the islands, spoke in Tahitian to Māori on the riverbank. They understood, but there was still trouble. A warrior named Terako from the Rongafakata Iwi was shot dead. On the third day, Cook snatched three young Māori fishermen and hosted them aboard the Endeavour, hoping that they'd tell their people he came in peace. Well, it's a pretty strange solution to go around kidnapping people. If that was your attempt at uh, some sort of reconciliation, well, we'll go and take on two fishing boats, kill three or four of them, kidnap three of them, take them aboard our, our strange ship in the hope that we can reconcile the events prior to that. Um, it doesn't sit well with, um, with the Tūranga people, particularly with Ngāti Unione. James Cook opened the way for European settlers to come here, and in time, as Gisborne grew, the Tūranga Māori played a big part in building the port on which the city was based. Wharves were strung along the foreshore, and a harbour was dredged out of the Tūranganui River. Nick Tupara's marae was also moved to make way for port development. Yes, this is the original location of the Ngāti Unione marae. On the right-hand side of the road here, we have the, the burial ground, the, the Urupā, and on the left here is now this... Uh, fish processing plant is where their meeting house was. Someone with a keen interest in Gisborne's port development is Harbour Master Captain Ian Cook, no relation, who took me out on the Takatimu, the oldest working pilot boat in New Zealand. Well, I believe the harbour is all important to Gisborne. I, I think it's Gisborne's greatest asset. Originally, it was a river port, you see and the ships were all tied up on the other side of the river there, but on one occasion the river silted up so badly the ships were stuck inside the river for about three months before they could dig them out. So uh, the decision was then made to, to build this diversion wall. This wall bisects the river and the harbour it, per it se? Takes, that's correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's no flow of water in the harbour, but there's quite a strong current in the other side. Okay. So up here, I mean, there's a huge expanse of, of logs. I mean, obviously this industry is fairly important to the bay, yeah? Well, it's the most important thing as far as this port is concerned. Yeah. It's doubling every other year, and very soon the port with only two major wharfs is not going to be able to cope. Today, this slipway is the closest we can get to the site of first contact, and it was here, when Cook returned the three young Māori he kidnapped, that a red marine's coat was draped over the body of Terako a gesture of reconciliation to the Turanga people. Their warriors had come here in force. Yeah. Um, and quite fortunately, I think, for Cook, the three that he had taken on board had convinced them sufficiently enough that um, these strangers hadn't harmed them. Um, so there wasn't a repeat of the aggressions of yesterday at this end of the beach. Yeah. The Marines' uh, military jacket was taken by the tribe back to, to uh, their people and was held as a taonga uh, of the strange, momentous occasion. Cook left, shaken by the violence of the last three days and without the fresh water and supplies he needed. Cook had planned to call this Endeavour Bay but changed it to Poverty Bay because he said it afforded no one thing we wanted. It'd be fair to say the Turanga people were pleased to see him go. And now I'm off to, on my dream trip, to follow Cook's Wake and circumnavigate New Zealand. To see this country from the sea, to meet the mariners of today and to gain a deeper understanding of New Zealand's nautical traditions. And what a way to start. Aboard the magnificent sailing ship Spirit of New Zealand, 
I'm excited, eager and just a tad nervous. But the sea is no place for a faint heart and Cook's own words are a great encouragement to me. When I think of the inhospitable parts I'm going to, I think the voyage dangerous. I, however, enter upon it with great cheerfulness. Providence has been very kind to me on many occasions, and I trust in a continuation of divine protection. I'm off on the spirit of New Zealand, on the first leg of my sea voyage right around New Zealand, following the wake of James Cook's endeavour. From Poverty Bay, Cook sailed south. At a capey named Kidnappers, Maori and Waka tried to abduct a young Tahitian boy from aboard the Endeavour. The coastline ahead was forbidding, with no sign of a safe harbour, so Cook turned around and headed back north. Spirit of New Zealand and its predecessor Spirit of Adventure have introduced tens of thousands of young Kiwis to life on the ocean wave. Today we're sailing from Poverty Bay, following Endeavour's course north to Uawa, a place Cook called Tolaga Bay. The young trainees in the middle of a 10-day trip have quickly learned that sailing this ship means working together. A lot of people who come on board already have a passion for the sea, and a lot of people who come on board it opens their eyes and they're like, wow, what a beautiful country we have, what a fantastic way to spend your time. The aim of the voyage is to develop the person, give them an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to come away from anything they know at home, anything they might have experienced before, putting up a big sail, a five ton sail. If they get it wrong the first time, doesn't matter. Try again. The aim's to try, give things a go and see how it goes. Life skills, confidence building sort of stuff. Yep, that's the way. But everybody's in the same boat. The Endeavour was a North Sea Collier, exactly the sort of ship that young James Cook learned to sail in. It was extensively refitted for the voyage, expected to take three years. Below deck, it held large quantities of supplies and scientific equipment. Cook's Endeavour was a square rigger just like this, but a lot smaller, only about two-thirds the size. She was round-bottomed, great in rough seas. She was beamy, but she rolled like a pig. On board were 85 men, officers, scientists, seamen and marines, and also an entire barnyard. There were chickens, ducks, pigs, sheep, a goat, two dogs, a ship's cat, and a shipload of rats. You can imagine the smell. Cook tried sailing in here at Tolaga Bay, but the wind was against him, so he continued up to a place he thought the Maori called Tegadu. Tegadu was in fact a Naura Bay, where the local Hoiti people greeted the visitors with caution and curiosity. The Endeavour anchored for two days, and the crew wandered freely ashore but it was madness trying to get 200 kilo water barrels out through the surf. So the Hoiti directed Cook back to Tolaga Bay to a hidden cove, sheltered from the wind and the waves. And it's here the spirit of New Zealand drops me off. I won't see her again until the end of my voyage. The cove's beautiful coastline has barely changed since Cook's day, although the native bush has long gone. It was in this bush that Cook and his scientists found plants and trees completely unknown where they came from, guaranteeing this quiet cove an important place in botanical history. For Sidney Parkinson, the Endeavour's young artist, the cove was a revelation. Sidney Parkinson was moved to describe this cove and countryside as agreeable beyond description. And it was in these peaceful, idyllic surroundings that Cook and his crew finally had a chance to take stock of their situation. And Cook himself walked all around these hills, observing Maori life close at hand. The Endeavour stayed at anchor for a week, trading fish with the Maori and loading water, firewood and the wild herbs that Cook called scurvy grass. The Tahitian high priest Tupaya chose not to sleep aboard the Endeavour, but camped up here in what's still called Tupaya's Cave. Tupaya was a big hit with the locals here. He used to sit in his cave here with them and swap stories. And it was largely due to his relationship with the local iwi that Cook and his crew had such a pleasant and peaceful stay here. 
The hills around the cove were covered in flowering shrubs. Botanist Joseph Banks was ecstatic. The young rich Dandy Banks had spent £10,000 of his own money setting up the endeavour as a floating laboratory. His colleague Daniel Solander was a student of famous naturalist Carl Linnaeus, whose theories on species classification and biological diversity helped scientists understand the natural world. Linnaeus had, had said, 10,000 plants, that's probably about as many plants as there are in the entire world. And of course, as soon as uh, Banks and Solander stepped ashore into places like this and looked around them, they realised that that wasn't the case at all, that, that, that the world is full of an extraordinary diversity of biological life and that what Linnaeus had purported to be the case, uh, in fact, the reality was something very, very different. Parkinson's original sketches of the plant life here were eventually enhanced and produced as the famous Florilegium collection. Cook ordered the collection of greens like this variety of celery to make soup, which he credited with keeping his men healthy, although he didn't know it was the vitamin C in the plants that prevented the deadly disease scurvy, the scourge of long-distance sea voyages. Can I? Go for it. Does it taste like? It's um, not unpleasant. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Banks had a very similar response to this feature when he first saw it. He described it as a, an extraordinary natural curiosity and the most pleasant surprise I have ever met with. Sidney Parkinson did a sketch of this, didn't he? Yes, he did. The sort of picturesque ideal of landscape was very much in vogue at the time and uh, it was Parkinson's sketch of, of this particular archway that prompted uh, considerable interest in, in archways as features in landscape. Well, here we are, back on the rough side, eh? Yeah, it's a bit lumpy, all right? Yeah. This is Tolaga Bay Wharf. My next lift is coming in there. It's going to pick me up there tomorrow. It's about half a kilometre long, I'm told. OK. Hey, nice to meet you, Simon. And you, Peter. And thanks for today. You're most welcome. Cheers. It's said to be the longest wharf in the southern hemisphere. But the ferro cement has been crumbling since it went up. It was built by the Tolaga Bay Harbour Board for local farmers, who just like Cook, found it very tough loading out through the surf. The wharf was finished in 1929 at a cost of £100,000. Sadly, already a concrete white elephant, because the roads were going in and bigger ships than the wharf could handle were now plying the east coast. Now Tolaga Bay, where we are now, was the first bay in New Zealand to be hydrographically surveyed by Cook and his crew. And now, 231 years later, the latest hydrographic survey vessel, HMNZS Resolution, is here to pick me up. And there she is. The Resolution is sailing north after, appropriately enough, surveying part of Cook Strait. I must say it's jolly decent of the Navy to swing by for me like this, but there is one small problem already. There are no steps down from the wharf, only one wet, slimy, and I use the term loosely, ladder. Hey Peter, Lieutenant Matthew, right up the resolution. How are you doing, Matt? Let's go. Well... The Endeavour was on a naval expedition, so it's great to hitch a ride with our Navy, especially on this ship, named in honour of Cook's Resolution, the ship used on his second and third voyages to the Pacific. How do you do, Clive? Like you meet uh, Lieutenant Commander Bob Hall. He's the executive officer. Awesome. How do you do, Bob? Welcome on board, Peter. Thanks very much. The East Cape is a fairly notorious piece of coastline. There's nowhere to run in bad weather. No safe harbour up this way. And as they say at sea, the bones of better sailors than me are lying underneath these waves. Thank goodness for a big, powerful ship. James Cook 
Cook's surveys of the New Zealand coastline were amazing in that they were achieved with basically a sextant and a piece of knotted string known as a lead line. By comparison, my home for the next couple of days is equipped with all the latest bells and whistles, the New Zealand Navy's hydrographic survey ship, Resolution. The Resolution was bought from the American Navy and fitted with a multi-beam echo sounder, sophisticated technology to enhance our Navy's long tradition of surveying our coastal waters. She's taking me from Tolaga Bay, up around East Cape, through the Bay of Plenty, and on to Mount Maunganui. It's great to be amongst naval sailors with such respect for the man in whose wake I'm travelling. Yes, he was uh, the ultimate, really. Uh, what he was able to achieve way back then with the technology he had available just leaves me in awe. Uh, now we have GPS, DGPS, multi-beam echo sounders. He was able to sail away for five years and keep his men fit and healthy and, and motivated mm. um, and achieve so much. And that was all based on his, basically his own ability. Captain's Log, October 31st, 1769. This point of land I have called East Cape because I have great reason to think that it is the easternmost land on this whole coast. Well, good luck, James. The continued fair weather allowed Cook to sail the endeavour close to the coast, which he charted in his meticulous way. He found the land fertile and well inhabited, and called it the Bay of Plenty. Now this is a view to wake up to. In the night, the resolution is snuck up to the bay's most active attraction, White Island. Named by James Cook because he said, that's how it appeared to us. He didn't sail too close, but the island may not have been putting on a show, for Cook makes no mention of any volcanic activity. It's rugged on top of the water and mountainous on the sea floor as we can see courtesy of the Resolution's advanced technology. At the moment this is where the, the ship is. We, we just passed over the top of uh, a sea mount, a, a knoll just to the northeast of White Island. The blue at the top is the fairly flat top of the, the hill itself at about 200 metres depth. And then the, the concentric circles are the, the depths as it gets deeper either side of the, the hill. It goes down to about six or 700 metres either side. Under the United Nations Law of the Sea, New Zealand can claim jurisdiction over its continental shelf out to a depth of two and a half kilometres. That's all the red, yellow and green parts of this map. This huge area needs surveying. Then, maybe, its vast natural resources can be tapped. Out on the continental shelf, we're looking at hydrocarbon deposits. Um, You're talking about gas here, aren't you? Petrol? Gas, yeah, oil. petrol, oil, all those type of things. And with the advances of technology, yeah. one day we may be able to uh, explore or recover deposits from those areas, way out in those sort of very, very deep wow. areas. So it's, it's a big job and it's a large amount of real estate. As Cook navigated close to shore, he logged an island the Māori called Mo Tohora. His translation was whale. And this high round mountain, he called Mount Edgecombe. Māori would have watched the endeavour from Toys Par above Whakatane. The Tupuna arrived here in the great Māori waka Matatua, whose heroine Wairaka still greets and farewells sailors across the Whakatane bar. From here, Cook and crew were chased by a double hull waka, the first they'd seen in New Zealand. This was the type of craft that brought the early Māori from Polynesia. Cook reports seeing hundreds of waka on this coastline. Seafaring was a major activity here. All along this coast they noticed heavily fortified villages, built on cliff tops and surrounded by deep ditches and high palisades. Joseph Banks concluded that this area was so rich that he described it as such that it might be the residence of their princes. And indeed, our next stop is still a princely location, Mount Maunganui, synonymous with sea, sun and summer holidays. Cook logged the mountain and sailed right past, but I'm off. Cheers, resolution. Keep up the good work. Tauranga is one of the busiest ports in the country, but I've come to see a much smaller boat, a boat in which thousands of Kiwi kids, including myself, learn to sail, the P-Class. So what's special about sailing a P-Class for you? Um, it's a harder boat to sail. It's a challenge, isn't it? So it yeah, turns fast and, yeah. and it falls over a lot. 
Yeah, <laughs> You could describe the P-Class as the cradle of the cup. America's cup, that is. Many young sailors who have won the National P-Class Championship have gone on to great things. There's been Chris Dixon, Russell Coots, uh, Dean Barker. Was Peter Gary Blake Tom. a P-Class sailor? Peter Blake was a P-Class sailor, but Peter was the, the sort of guy that, that outgrew it very yeah. early. Harry Hyatt designed the P-Class and sailed it for the first time at the Whangarei Regatta in 1921. When he moved here, his little boat became the Tauranga class. In 1976, it was renamed the P-Class. P for Prima. Sailing a P-Class well demands agility, self-reliance and nerve. With the safety of young sailors in mind, Hyatt designed the hull with airtight compartments, so it's virtually unsinkable, which is good because they tip over. A lot. Now he doesn't want to get his hair wet, so he's climbed up the top, over the side, onto the centreboard, reweights it, boat comes up out of the water, sail up into the wind, climbs up over the side, back on again. Clean as a whistle, makes it look easy. The boom, or the foot of the sail, is longer than the total length of the boat. Mm. Um, because of this, it's got a, a lot of sail relative to the size of the boat. And probably by modern standards, it's also a bit out of balance. If it's too easy to sail in, then nobody learns very much. Because it's hard to control downwind, we produce the best offshore helmsman in the world, without question. But when you're cold and you're wet, it's still nice to see mum. The Mount is home to a huge fleet of pleasure boats, and my next captain is a real pleasure. He sells a boat called the Gemini Galaxy, and his name is Graham Butler. Hey Peter. Hey Graham. How are you? Good man. It's good. Yeah. Bloody yeah, good weather day. gods for us today, eh? Yeah. Good day. Awesome day. Worth waiting for. All right. Brilliant. Let's Shall we go and do it, eh? Yeah. Beauty. Yeah. Don't trip over. <laughs> <laughs> she's an awesome old ship, actually. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's she can handle it. She's really good. She's slow and heavy, and she's done tens of thousands of miles. She's pretty good. Yeah. One of the hardest working boats in the Bay of Plenty, probably. Graham's in the Echo Tour charter business. Although, spending a life at sea isn't a business really, is it? More of a pleasure. I think I'm going to enjoy this trip. There's a very good chance I'll be uh, dancing with dolphins. When the Endeavour sailed past Mount Maunganui, the weather packed in. Northeasterly gales and hazy conditions, which is fortunately what we haven't got. These conditions are perfect for dolphin watching. And Graham reckons we're bound to see some on our way up from the Mount, past the Mare and Alderman Islands, to Cook's Beach in Mercury Bay. We've only gone halfway to the Mare when Graham spots what he's after. So these gannets, when they dive in, this is a, a great sign. It is a, it is a good sign for dolphins. Yeah. Normally we'll find them associated with gannets. They're the birds that feed on the actual food that dolphins feed on. See the splashes? There's quite big splashes up there. That's, a, oh, yeah. that's quite okay. a big oh, pot yeah, of okay. dolphins. Now, there's quite a lot of water. Yeah, okay. yeah well, that would be big. Just dolphins whacking through the surface. Oh, look at them. They're going for it, though. There's quite a few of them. Yoo-hoo! Oh, look at them coming into us. Look at them. Hey, this is it. Look at this. These are common dolphins. <laughs> and they're just... Oh, yeah. wow. There must be about 20 of them. Um, I think when we get up there, you probably find this place to do 120, but oh, that's really? just my guess. Fantastic. Yeah. There'll be dolphins. Um, oh, man, look at that. And it's the same old deal, you know. We've got to approach them very quietly and carefully and let them call the shots as to what <laughs> we're going to do. <laughs> They move, they're just absolutely athletic. Incredible. The water's just live with them. Oh, just sensational. I wonder what it is about seeing them that just makes you so excited. I don't know. 
something about them just makes you go nutty. <laughs> Most of the people that I bring out on my boat are not, are not fishermen. They are not people who know much about the sea. Yeah. And they come here and it's just, they just get an absolute thrill to, to be basically greeted by animals that have absolutely no fear of us. It, it's almost like a reaffirmation that, that uh, somebody out there loves us. You can see them turn over in front yeah. of you, the eyes there, yeah. and then they sort of leap out of the water and go, see, what do you think of yeah, that? Yeah. You know, it's a very cool thing to watch. It is, it's a cool thing to watch. <laughs> the Endeavour passed an island which Cook called the Mare. The Māori knew it as Tuhua and treasured its rich black veins of the volcanic glass, obsidian. You can get shards of it that are really sharp. And yeah. it's a very hard volcanic glass, yeah. so it holds its edge. So they could use it as carting and carving tools, and so it was extraordinarily valuable to Maori people. So um, it was traded. The legend has it that it was discovered in Tahiti from here, all over New Zealand from here. Yeah. Anyone ever tried to mine it? Yeah. In the 50s and 60s, a barge used to come out here, and the guys would climb it onto the rocks with hammers, and, and they would just break it all off, take it away. Bloody effrontery of people in those days, eh? It's just extraordinary. You just, well, oh, it should be right, mate. We just go out there and hack it all to bits. So, this is actually a volcano, this island? Yeah. Oh. Well, this is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the Bay of Bendy. It is probably more dangerous than White Island because it has a history of going like Mount St. Helens, just going go bomb, and it does it every four or five thousand years, apparently. It hasn't done it for four or five thousand years, so hang on to your bloody hat, Peter. <laughs> this <laughs> might be the day. Can you see anything shaking? <laughs> Some of these remarkable islands up ahead were inhabited when Cook sailed through here. And it must have been a good day aboard the Endeavour, because Cook and his crew spent some time likening these islands to various city councillors from London. Short, fat, thin, wide, mean. <laughs> and you can see all those bricks and little rocks and stacks and things that are poking up out of the water. Well, this is probably... Incredible rocks, yeah. yeah. It was probably that number just underneath it's ready to rip the backside out of a boat too. That would have cheered him up too, yeah, no well, And he had no charts. Yeah. He made all his own charts out there. I mean, Cook was just an absolutely extraordinary person. It is pretty out here, isn't it? It is pretty. Yeah. It is very amazing. Yeah. If you can say very amazing. You're starting to talk like a sailor. You've been at sea for too long, Peter. <laughs> it's time you went and had a Big Mac. <laughs> strong sense of gratitude to the planet <laughs> yeah. for being such a bloody nice place yeah. to hang out on, you know. Yeah. You have this notion that it's just a great big hot rock happening through space from, from God knows where to God knows where, you know, and just sort of hanging on in there. Yeah. But I, I think I'm extraordinarily lucky to be able to hang on and, and play with these animals and hang out at sea. And just, I think it's really good. Captain's Log, Saturday, November 4th, 1769. My reasons for putting in here were in the hopes of discovering a good harbour, some convenient place to observe the transit of Mercury which happens on the 9th inst, and will be wholly visible here if the day is clear. If we should be so fortunate as to obtain this observation, the longitude of this place and country will thereby be very accurately determined. The Endeavour anchored here off Purangi at the south end of what today is known as Cook's Beach. Just ashore, they found a freshwater stream, a perfect watering place. Cook ordered the Endeavour heeled over and the hulls scrubbed. 
In his memoirs, Orete Tutanifa wrote that as a young boy, he went aboard the Endeavour at Purangi and was given a nail by James Cook. Tetanifa wrote, There was one supreme man in that ship. We knew that he was lord by his perfect gentlemanly and noble demeanour. Oh, look at that. This is the kind of technology that Cook would have had. So this is what he navigated with? Yeah, he would have. He used a sextant basically to get um, the angle between a celestial body like the sun and the horizon. So when you're looking at the sun and you, you've brought the sun down, you've brought the angle down like this. Yeah. And then down here you could read off that exact angle. Yeah. And he could get a noon latitude from that very easily. Right. The, difficult, the difficulty that Cook had was getting a longitude. Good God, it's an amazingly accurate piece of equipment, oh, isn't it's it? incredible. It just, uh, you know, these things should be absolutely cherished. They're a much more beautiful instrument than a GPS. They're just extraordinary. It's a really nice piece of history, I think. Much better than a GPS. GPS, the global positioning system, uses satellites to navigate. Cook had to use the sun, the stars and the planets, so he needed clear weather. After days of rain, conditions lifted on cue on November the 9th. Cook and his astronomer Charles Green rode ashore. Thank you, mate. Thanks a lot, Peter. All the best. Well, um, you may want your life jacket. <laughs> Bugger. Just like the holiday makers who flock here every summer, Cook and Green put up a tent. Inside, they set up their instruments. They watched the path of Mercury across the sun and made their calculations, figuring out the latitude and longitude of Mercury Bay. Effectively, this put New Zealand accurately on the world map for the very first time. But while history was being made on shore, there was trouble out in the bay. Lieutenant Gore, who'd been left aboard the Endeavour, shot one of the local Maori who, according to Titanifa, had failed to hand over a dogskin mat in return for a length of cloth that they'd been trading for. Now again, according to Titanifa, the man was a noted thief, and with a meeting of his people, they decided not to avenge his death, but Cook himself was absolutely furious, and he said that we have been long enough amongst these people to know how to chastise trifling faults without taking away their very lives. Whilst Cook had fixed New Zealand's position for the first time, he was still to figure out how to establish peaceful relationships with Māori. And to survive in this remote land with its dangerous uncharted coast, this was something he had to do. Captain's Log, Sunday, November 12th, 1769. I went with the pinnace and the yawl, accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander, over to the north side of the bay, in order to take a view of the country and the fortified village which stands there. The local iwi, the Ngāti Hei, had about 70 power along this coastline. Cook wrote that the people must be accustomed to long and frequent wars. Even offshore islands like this now collapsed arch were fortified. The party came ashore on the nearby beach. As they walked along, they were joined by more than a hundred Ngāti Hei, who gave Cook a formal welcome, his first porphyry. Today, the Ngāti Hei are still here. What a beautiful spot you've got here. Well, it is. I think everyone feels that way about this spot. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, this, is, this is where the paths were originally up on the hills here. Yes. Fari Taiwa was uh, the ancient power of Ngāti Hei. That's the one that Captain Cook went into. They even put on a mock Taiaha battle for Cook's benefit just to show him how they handled their arms and how they used a Taiaha. This is my first porphyry too, and I'm surprised by the depth of emotion it stirs in me. There's a giving of respect and ceremony that sits comfortably with my own attitudes. The offer of such warmth and welcome makes me feel, perhaps oddly, like I've been invited to come home.
Ka tītī roa te waka in te wā. Ka tītī roa ngā waka o ngā tihei. Ka tītī roa me ngā manu kārere. Ka tītī roa. If Cook felt this too, I can see why this place became so important to him. Cook gave the Natihe chief Toyawa some small potatoes which were cropped here on the flat. In time the variety was known near and far. These were the first Maori potatoes. The Natihe took Cook up the path to their pa, Faritaiwa. They said they were often attacked by other tribes, that was why they had so many pa. They always had a refuge. But Faritaiwa was their main stronghold and fiercely protected. Cook intimated that there was some sort of a uh, constraint in the Maioro and that there was a barricade and a door here. And of course above him at this point are uh, the palisading from which people could defend the place. If you take a look at these stones, Pete, Peter, that's called the Patukirikiri. Uh, if you just try that in your hand, and you, you see how natural it fits into your hand. Mm. And they were used with deadly accuracy. And they're still here. These are the original Patu Kirikiri. It used to be on the stages. They were heaped up mm. in readiness for battle. Just as their tūpuna did, the Ngātihe of today protect Faritaiwa and its place in New Zealand history. A lot happened after Cook's visit. He had to adapt and change. That's what Toyawa saw. He saw the musket in action. He saw the shags falling out of the trees. And he knew, I'm sure that he knew, that the path of Māori was about to change, whether we liked it or not. I mean, this place is so hugely significant in terms of um, what's happened here historically for Māori and for Pākehā. We have to look after this place. Captain's Log, 15th November 1769. Before we left this bay, we cut upon one of the trees near the watering place, the ship's name, date, etc. And after displaying the English colours, I took formal possession of the place in the name of His Majesty. Cook's orders were to get permission from locals before claiming their land. Although the Ngāti Hei couldn't have realised the significance of the flag raising, Cook obviously felt secure enough to do it. It's a unique event in the country's past, and it's strange no one knows exactly where it happened. The only clue Cook gave was near the watering place. Ten feet that way is the stream. Fifty feet that way is the beach. And here's a rock promontory surveying the entire bay. In Cook's day there would have been less trees here, but you can even now, you can see out through it. It's, um, everything in me screams that this is the place where Cook raised the flag. In fact, I'm, um, I'm breaking out in goosebumps. Well, James, tomorrow we move on. But for now, I'm just going to spend some time right here in your watering place. I've been feeling pretty special about this bay and these people all day. I can't describe exactly what I feel except to say that in some special way I've been given a gift. Almost an anchoring by some extraordinary people in one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. In the words of Graham Butler, I feel pretty damn happy to be hurtling through space on this hot rock. So happy, in fact, I had to strip off and give myself a sort of natural baptism in the river. At sunset, in the bush, by the sea.
This program was made with funding from New Zealand on air.